Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Part two here of the Napoleonic Wars by Oversimplified. Thank you for all your comments on part one. I've really enjoyed reading it. I had a bit of a discussion of whether Napoleon really is sort of a benevolent dictator, what that sort of means and comparing that to history. So thank you for the discussion on that one. Well, at this point in part two, Napoleon is basically on top of the world. He's one of the most powerful men in Europe possibly the most powerful man in the world at this time. And he has completely destroyed the first three coalitions against him. He has embarrassed Austria so many times. Napoleon is <laughs> definitely one of Austria's arch and nemesis at this time and are com just continuing to embarrass the Austrians. And Britain is getting a little bit upset about this. So let's find out what Britain does here and the other coalition partners in part two for the Napoleonic Wars by Oversimplified. If you haven't already yet, Please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Thank you all for the support. Let's get into it. After the Third and Fourth Coalition Wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent, and he was now undoubtedly the master of Europe. After the go. Battle of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river for negotiations. They had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like yeah. a house on fire. They oh, laughed oh, together. Oh, oh. They chatted long into the night. They kissed. The two had a lot of mutual respect, and Napoleon even told his wife that if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. <laughs> kind of a weird thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, they came to an amicable agreement. Russia would lose barely any land, and in return, they'd join France against the UK and invade Sweden. Win-win mm. on the other. So that Finnish war, actually. So this was a m complete disaster for uh, for uh, the Swedes, actually. And this was one of the things that uh, that Gustav IV actually was overthrown by his brother because of his mismanagement of the Finnish war. And this would lead to Sweden pretty much permanently losing Finland. Finland would never go back to Swedish control ever again. And eventually the Finns would get their independence in 1917 after well still during but after for the russians world war one and uh yeah it's quite a little interesting bit of uh of history for that one and i wonder why i think that's oland or malmo i don't remember sorry but i don't know why that's connected there but anyway so yeah win-win on the other hand frederick william iii was sidelined and prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to french client states yep. only the uk remained as the last major threat to napoleon and they continued to be a big thorn in his side, constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful navy to wreak havoc on French trade and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The British were safe across the channel. Well, he said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you with money. Earlier yep. in 1806, Napoleon had announced the Continental System, a total shutoff of the UK from continental trade. No one in Europe was to trade with Britain, and Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. The British economy did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion, by going to Copenhagen and blowing a bunch of stuff up. But in general, the British managed to stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Many neutral countries found themselves stuck between hmm. a rock and a hard place, as the two European superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy. Hey America, you better not trade with the French, or else I'll come burn down the White House. What? This is gonna wreck my economy! I need to start saving money. How the heck am I going to start saving money? Yeah, that's right. You know where this is going. Do you like <laughs> shopping in store? Nice. Um, so to comment, well, let's, let's see what he talks about after this little line. Oh, right yeah. Here. Making peace with the Russians, a continental blockade, and blowing up Copenhagen. Again. Sick of being blown up for doing almost nothing and under significant pressure from... Yeah, so just to talk about America, too. So think about this, right? America, obviously, um, you know, founded, if you will, in 1776. And at this point, it hasn't been really that long. It's still relatively a young country, if you will. Um, and now their former, you know, their former master, their former, you know, uh, what would you say, their colonial overlord is now asking them to not trade with their enemies after France has already given them so much um, during the American Revolutionary War, too. So I think that's kind of funny, you know, how you know, our former, our former colonial overlord is now asking us for their, for our support. Kind of funny. Napoleon, the Danish officially sided with France, but Napoleon's block- <laughs> After being harangued and blown up by the British. Okay, it had the biggest effect on continental Europe, who were now cut off from a major trading partner, one yep. that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing empire. 
think about this too, right? This is not just Britain itself. It's also the British Empire. So you have Canada, you had you would have India, right? Australia at this point and all in South Africa, all the other territories in Africa as well. So this is a really huge um, you know, trading partner that they're being blocked off here. It's not just England itself, but it's all the other resources from all around the world. And a lot of countries didn't fully comply. Portugal, a traditional British ally, refused to take part. No problem. Napoleon sent an army and yep. invaded. But it wasn't just Portugal. Many of Napoleon's allies were also suspect. Your Majesty. Yeah, and the invasion of Portugal too was very, very quick. I think it was like maybe three weeks until the country was completely overtaken by France. It seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I'd beat them up. Do I even have any real friends? Are you my friend, Pierre? Say yes or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to mistrust his ally to the south. And in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting? Meanwhile, you let this ambitious nobody who dislikes me run the country. And you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife. And what's worse, <laughs> who the heck are you? I'm, I'm the, the king's son. son. I yep. just overthrew my dad. So actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French forces, many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, occupied Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. <laughs> All right, we're here with the royal family of Spain. Um, so, Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I just think we're great. Well, I've got the test results right here. Fernando, in the case of the Spanish throne, you are not, not the, the king. king. <laughs> and Carlos, you're not the king you either. You are also not the king. I'm the king. Oh, his brother's the king. Details. Actually, Napoleon made his brother the king, but for all intents and purposes, Spain was now his puppet. And this is going to have some massive consequences. So, for example, when, when, spoiler alert, when Napoleon goes to invade Russia, there are thousands of French troops that are garrisoned in Spain. And Spain is going to be a constant thorn in, in Napoleon's side that's sucking up a lot of manpower, a lot of resources, and a lot of money, too. And this is going to be sort of one of the big uh, pieces that leads to Napoleon's downfall and his eventual defeat. He expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. Yeah, no. Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power, least yep. of all one who had previously attacked the Catholic Church. Yes. And so the people of Spain Oof. revolted. Brutal fighting broke out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across yep. the kingdom, and vicious atrocities were committed on both They're sides. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies. But before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. The whole thing became a nightmare for the emperor. He excelled at traditional warfare, but this was something more akin to Napoleon's yeah, exactly. Vietnam. The whole conflict would keep hundreds of thousands of French soldiers and resources bogged down for years. Right, and just to sort of note here is that this map is not entirely accurate in the sense that these were the established front lines, right? It was rather that... Um, as he says here, there was a guerrilla warfare going on and that places would be attacked and then rebels would pull out or they would briefly be under control or things like this. It was not this sort of traditional front line that you see here. Um, I'm not as sure about Portugal, perhaps. Maybe there was a solid force and maybe that was sort of, what would you say, conquered, if you will. Um, but yeah, it really was sort of like Napoleon's Vietnam. I think that's a good comparison that he made there. Napoleon was never able to break the will of the Spanish people, and this problem yeah, weakened his years, position right? in Europe. <laughs> hey Francis, want to go to war with Napoleon again? 
Oh, I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. <laughs> well, okay. Seeing yeah, that Napoleon true. was now caught up in Spain, and with some British funding, Austria decided maybe, just maybe, this time, they'd have a chance. So did they? No. Napoleon defeated them in just four months. It was quick, but it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So this time, the Austrians gave him a run for his money. Yeah, and not only that too, so it's not just inexperienced conscripts, it's also soldiers that are not French, right? The Grand, the Grand Armée at this point is made up of, of, Dutch, uh, of Dutch people, Germans, Belgians, um, even some Italians, right? It's people from all over, all of Europe, and you run into the same issue that eventually, you know, that Austria itself also would deal with. And I know more information about this for Austria-Hungary during World War One, but you have communication issues, language issues, right? The officers are speaking French, the troops are speaking Dutch, Italian, um, you know, all the different various languages here that they would be a part of. And so eventually the, the Grand Armée, although it's still going to perform some miracles. You'll see it's it's starting to sort of, you know, what would you say? Decreasing quality in a way. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Yeah, see that 40,000 to 34,000 member before when it was three to one casualties for, for France in this game. Well, one casualty for every three for the Austrians. So they're getting a lot closer here and they're learning too. Still, Napoleon had yet again kicked Francis's butt and as part of the peace terms, Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, however, Napoleon and Francis came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis's young daughter. Yes. But wait, doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes, he did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another, but now that Napoleon was playing the monarch game, he needed a male heir, and his aging wife wasn't yeah. giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At yeah. least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, <laughs> they... I mean, this, this was written on the last comment too, but yeah, the, the, the love between Napoleon and Josephine is very interesting, very complicated. And as I said in the last video, right, one of his last words was in fact Josephine. So whether he truly loved... Um, you know, his, his new wife here. He felt that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. So through the marriage, <laughs> Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. Between the failing blockade <laughs> nice. against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. But still, look at this map. Yeah. So blue, Seriously. so beautiful. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting oh, chain of events, go. ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Yep. Marshal Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after agreeing to... And the Swedish royal family to this day still traces their lineage back to that, so hence the Swedish royal family, I believe, is mostly French, if you will. And Bernadotte, too, this was also a big loss for Napoleon overall, and I don't remember the exact specifics. I watched Epic History TV's uh, Napoleon series a couple years ago, but this was a big loss for Napoleon too, because Bernadotte is one of his best generals, um, and this would be felt uh, later in the coming in the coming conflicts. Join Napoleon's continental system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless <laughs> string of victories. All he had to do now was sit back and not make any major miscalculations that could completely turn the tide of war. So let's see what comes next. Yeah. France's alliance with Russia was a terrifying prospect. Together, the two could have been unstoppable, but unfortunately, the alliance didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade and eventually they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alexander? But he kissed me. He <laughs> kissed you? You wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, made yeah. up of troops from every corner of his empire, and he prepared to invade. Okay, it looks like Napoleon's coming for us. Generals, I need ideas. We could stand and fight. No, that's stupid. 
You're stupid. We could run away. You. You're a star. You'll remember Napoleon. It's actually a better idea. I'm, I'm not kidding. He, he actually is a star in that sense. And yeah, I'll, I'll let him explain. His tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you. Scorched Earth. If his yes. opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his... Let's <laughs> say, Glutentag Backerei. Okay. <laughs> Why, that's German? Why not? His supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy. And if he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy, I think you get the point. Napoleon launched his invasion and hoped for a quick battle. But all he could do was try to catch the retreating Russians while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. As he went, the horribly hot summer devastated his army. One of the his hottest men died of heat, too. exhaustion, and disease. Supplies began to run out, and his men began to starve. Many deserted, and still the Russians continued to retreat. Numerous times, Napoleon considered turning back, but that little voice in his head kept on telling him, keep going, just a little further. And don't worry, you're definitely average height for the time. <laughs> he nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, he predicted the Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city nope. without a fight. Burn it all. And he was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Borodino. The Russians fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. He launched a full frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. The Russians yeah. eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow to fall into Napoleon's hands. And so if you want a little bit more detail on this, I would highly recommend checking out Epic History TV's Napoleonic War series. It's it's got to be over three and a half hours. I think it. I don't remember. I, I think one of the. I think just Napoleon's invasion of Russia is is like ninety minutes in and of itself. And they go into some amazing detail with the battles themselves. And though that series, I have already seen it, and I decided to watch Oversimplifieds for the France Country series. That might be something I'm willing to check out on my Patreon. So, if you're interested, yeah, there's that there. But. Yeah, to say that marching into Russia, again, you still have the same issues where you have troops that are conscripts and you have the same language issues as well as Russia is just, just ginormous. And as we saw through Charles XII from the Great Northern War during the Russia series is that the more that they can just burn their land, scorch their earth and retreat, the worse and worse it's going to get for the invaders. Quick, the French are taking the city. Release all these prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well, Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your yep. luck. Moscow went up in flames. And as and so this is the, f I think if, if memory serves, this is the fourth time that Moscow has burned now. If I, if I remember that from the Russia country series. As Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. But he had just defeated the Russian army and taken their most beloved city. Doesn't in matter. his mind, he had won. Yep. So he sent Tsar Alexander in St. Petersburg a letter. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. Ever? Ever. But, Your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling supplies. If we don't say anything, well, then they'll all die. Oh! <laughs> After waiting for a response for about yep. a month, the first snow of winter began to fall, and Napoleon sensed the catastrophe that was about to unfold. Mm -hmm. He decided their only choice now was to get out. And so this was, and this is the thing too, right? And why he believed that Moscow was going to be the capitulation point for Alexander was that this is how it was in continental Europe, I guess, to call it for lack of a better word, continental Europe affairs, right? As soon as you capture the capital, you capture the heart of the country, you capture the government, you capture all the administration and everything like this, and then it's over, right? If you capture Vienna, in the case of, uh, of Austria, it's over. You capture uh, uh, Paris for the French, that's it, right? It's pretty much an immediate surrender, but with Russia, given the size of it, it's just, it doesn't function in the same way as the sort of continental Europe system, right? This was also a, a mistake that Adolf Hitler would run into, you know, what, a hundred or so years um, uh, later, thinking that Moscow was going to be the breaking point. And whether that was going to be, that's, that's an altist thing. And, you know, 
Maybe they would have moved the government to the Urals. Who knows? But this sort of idea that once you capture the capital, it's over, doesn't really apply to Russia. And that's when it happened. It got cold. Very cold. cold. His yeah. glorious invasion had just become a race for survival. As the Russians realized the French were Look fleeing the for too. their lives, they began to close in on their supply line. Men froze to death, their horses as well. Just take a look at this photo. And, 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 like, sorry, photo. Take a look at this painting. Like, yeah, you can only imagine just the bewildering amount of cold that these troops went through. And if you're a Dutchman or an Italian that's fighting for Napoleon's war, what are you thinking right now? There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road as yep. it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Yep. Napoleon, fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River, but a little Napoleon cleverness gave him the old Jeffrey Duke, tricking them into thinking <laughs> he was going south and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges to the north. When the Russians realized where he was and began to close yeah, in, the French brutal. burned the bridges yep. before everyone could cross. Yep. Hundreds drowned and thousands were captured. At this point, Napoleon got wind. Just an absolute massacre. And again, Epic History TV, they go more into this, but yeah, just horrible of plots against him forming in Paris, so he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining French stragglers made it across the border. It's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia. Less than 100,000 returned. Napoleon was that. now in a very precarious situation. His army had just been obliterated and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an opportunity to take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides, while Austria declared neutrality. Even Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. The and that's going to, that really, I think, if I remember correctly, Napoleon really took that personally as well. War of the Sixth Coalition had begun. Yep. The coalition forces had been reforming their armies, and they were now much better. And the UK had also significantly <laughs> amped up its financial aid to yep. its continental allies. Their armies quickly advanced. Interesting. Eh? So this is sort of like a Cold War in a sense for the UK that they're funding their allies, right? They're smaller, if you will, though, you know, Sweden and Russia are obviously not small allies. They're smaller allies to fight against them, right? Sort of, you know, a, a taste of what would come in the 20th century in a way through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he yep. called up over 100,000 new conscripts, mostly teenagers. He also put his <laughs> factories into overdrive, and he was like, you, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me! I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> As it turned out, Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics relied on speed, maneuverability, and destruction. Yep, when he took the sure. fight to the Allies in 1813, he did defeat them and sent them running. But lacking cavalry, he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy. He needed horses. For the Allies, being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning. So both also sides were like, but... hold up. Time out. The Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. But instead, he agreed to a brief truce with the Austrians mediating between the two sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. Having had their terms rejected, Austria felt now they were justified in saying, well, we tried, and they joined the coalition. Okay, everyone, look at us. The boys are back together, but Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Oh, no, 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 no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run, we run yep. away. Yep. Genius. He's a genius. The plan was as... And this is what I said in part one, is that Napoleon is best when and with direct confrontation. And this is what the Allies learned. is like, hey, let's just not fight Napoleon. Let's fight... His generals, let's let's pick our battles, right? And whenever Napoleon's there, we retreat. 
And it's a great tactic. It works incredibly well. Follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, whoever he advanced on would avoid battle, allowing yep. the others to sweep in from the sides and attack the French marshals guarding his flanks. Essentially, the plan was, don't try to fight Napoleon. Yep. And this plan worked tremendously. Mm -hmm. The Allies scored a number of victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand ah, yes. as the Allied armies converged in on him from all sides. The stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this battle is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. Look at that, I mean, wow. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. And so they did. When it became clear okay, that Napoleon cool, I didn't couldn't know that. win, he ordered a retreat across the only bridge over the river. The Allies swarmed into the city, and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed. After. You got that? Yes, Colonel. I'm not five. I can comprehend time. Good. Wait. Did he say before or after? <laughs> well, fortune favors the bull. <sighs> yep. The bridge was blown early, and 30,000 French troops were stranded and captured. A disaster. And with that, the dominoes were beginning to come crashing down on Napoleon. In the south, an army under the British Duke of Wellington had been pushing the French out of Spain for the past few- And remember, all, uh, excuse me, all the new conscripts that are being called up, there's still French troops sitting in Spain this whole time fighting a guerrilla war, right? So it's not even that, you know, they're fighting this one front war um, initially against the Russians and now the sixth, the sixth coalition, but arguably they're also fighting a two front war in Spain as well, which is also being backed by the British. Few years and we're now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat, who Napoleon had made King of Naples, decided to switch sides. Yep. German states, many resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him and the Confederation of the Rhine collapsed. Bernadotte invaded Denmark and they were forced to join the coalition while the Netherlands were liberated. You'd think Napoleon might have seen the writing on the wall, nope. but he was Napoleon. And so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, he called up more conscripts to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, <laughs> they all agreed that the ultimate aim was the deposition yeah. of Napoleon entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread out. His army was so miracle. small that he could move at lightning speed, and he used this to his advantage. In the famous Six Days campaign against Prussian General Blücher, he attacked from all directions and defeated Blücher's forces four times, only suffering a tenth of the casualties he inflicted. Yeah, you heard that right. A tenth of the casualties. Just 30,000 against 56,000, and you're dealing out a 10 to 1 ratio. It's astounding. Even with... Again, Epic History TV also has a video on this. Go check it out. ...his back completely to the wall. Napoleon was still Napoleon. Yep. Then he turned south to take on Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once. And wherever he wasn't, the Allies continued to push towards Paris. Exactly. He made one last ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off their communications. But Paris was in disarray and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, hey guys, come on in. And so they did. The city's defenders surrendered, and as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris had fallen. Quick, marshals, gather your men. We're gonna launch an assault on Paris. Where are my marshals? They all left and told me to give you this note. Napoleon's <laughs> marshals had realized what he hadn't. It was over, and they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate. And without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. 
old King Louis XVI's brother would become the king of France. It was Yikes. almost like the French Revolution had never even happened. And so it's kind of an interesting question, right, as to why they didn't kill Napoleon, why they didn't execute him, and why they chose to abdicate him. Actually, why they chose to force him to ab abdicate. Personally, I think it's because if they had have killed him, that would have looked really, really bad on them as they're sort of trying to patch up the French Revolution and pretend it never happened. To go and then execute basically another monarch, though in this case an emperor, would look really, really bad for them. And it could be an interesting question of what, you know, what would have happened if they had have executed Napoleon and then he wouldn't have returned. Spoiler alert, he returns. Um, yeah, to say it's kind of an interesting question. I don't know. What do you think? But what will we do with Napoleon? We can't have a hyperactive 44-year-old menace running around. I swear I've never seen this video before, I his return. Well, why don't we send him, mm, I don't know, there. The location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just yep. off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Allies must have been in stitches when they came up with that. When he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck. But it had gone out of date, so instead of a quick and painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. And off he went to exile. The deal that was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles, he was to receive a state pension from France, and he was able yep. to receive many distinguished visitors, all eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure and introducing many legal and social reforms aimed at improving life on the island. Hey, Napoleon. Again, <laughs> the ambition of Napoleon, the competence of Napoleon is just outstanding. He's on this tiny little island and he's introducing reforms to the to again the education system the infrastructure the the administrative system he's constantly reforming and making things better in his ideals which arguably i would argue are not poor or or not well thought out ideals it's just wow fascinating just coming in to check on how it's all going holy smokes yeah, but it wasn't yeah, all right? good for one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife, Josephine, and was yep. deeply saddened. He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Franz... Yeah, he allegedly locked himself in his room for two days and, and wouldn't come out after hearing about uh, Josephine's death. This ...had ordered a local count to seduce her, so she would forget about Napoleon. Then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. Mm, but the spoiler. biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. He had lived a thrilling life of adventure, fame, and glory. Now, he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean, and he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Hey, Napoleon, want to go back to France and reclaim your throne? I would, Pierre. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. And just go. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, pucker up, boyo. <laughs> Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He basically had kind of a leaving ceremony, yeah, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. He brought with him an army of about a thousand men, and he began his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king, and at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. That's right, oh, just the wait. king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. I know the economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace and we will definitely work as hard as we can to fix everything. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why we got rid of the king. As the Bourbon monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past and the returning nobility seemed hellbent on regaining their lost privileges, the people weren't too happy. And so, Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. And as far as I understand, too, is that this also kind of happened in some of the 
the former French client states as well as in some of the, especially in the Netherlands too, if I remember correctly, is that while as these monarchs were being reintroduced, right, there was a lot of discontent from the ideals that have been brought about through the French Revolution. And I'm not 100% certain on that, but that is something that I do vaguely remember about. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem. I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Yep. Famous, uh, your famous, Majesty, famous story here. It seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined his side. Yep. Well, I'm off to Belgium. If you ever need a king again, be sure to let me know. As Napoleon continued his journey, the king had sent battalions of men to stop him, but they largely comprised of Napoleon's old soldiers, many unhappy with King Louis's military reforms. And so, when ordered to arrest him, they simply couldn't do it. Quote. In one famous incident, say it? the troops yeah. began to cry out, long live the emperor. When Napoleon... Re yeah, and I, I think it's... I'm not going to remember it precisely, but the amazing quote is that... Basically, he says that if, you know... Do are you going to shoot me or arrest me or are you going to embrace your emperor, right? Or something along these lines. Just an amazing quote. Um, and then there's this famous painting too, where the the soldiers they throw up their arms in sort of jubilation and and then join Napoleon's side. Reached Paris with King Louis having fled. He entered unopposed to reclaim his throne. Napoleon was back from the dead. Okay, everyone. Now that we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure <laughs> something like this can never nope. happen again. What's that doing there? Hey, fellow monarchs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This time, Napoleon <laughs> promised he would be a mucho mucho good boy and not start any wars. Nope. But the allied leaders were having none of it. Yep. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war, not on France, but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple- Isn't that interesting that they didn't declare war on the nation, but on the leader of said nation. It's kind of cool. I wonder if that's ever happened before, actually, if that happened afterwards, too. Huh. Maybe you let me know below. Well, empires declaring war on you as an individual. That's how you know you're a very naughty boy. The mm, Allied yeah. powers began making... And I mean, look at this map, too. Again, you have, again, almost the entire continent against you. And I won't spoil it, but yeah, it does pretty well, all things considered plans to combine their forces and once again invade France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate and maybe he could hold on to his power. Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation yep. among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, and it was close. The British very, held the high ground and a number close. of key defensive buildings across the battlefield. After waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. French Marshal Ney launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. The British formed defensive square formations, and they tore the French cavalry to shreds, while one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line, and from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his Imperial Guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier begun to arrive, and now they were arriving in large numbers. And after the British held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, the French lines panicked, fearing they had been encircled, and they began to flee. The Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And would be forever memorialized by an ABBA song as well, which is probably the most, <laughs> you know, pop culture-wise, probably the most famous thing about Waterloo. It's important to note here that Napoleon actually 
he has an issue at this point where he has some health issues. And I believe he had, I think he had hemorrhoids or something along these lines where he couldn't be on his horse for too long, right? He couldn't, because typically he would ride around the battle and, and scope out and then uh, change orders or anything like this. But he was in, in his in his own personal best condition. And so he was not able to contribute as well as the uh, communication issues as well between his, I think it was Ule, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, he would he, he was not able to participate in the battle in the same manner as once before. And, you know, what would have happened if they had have won at Waterloo? I think that's an alternate history hub video, actually. And if you're interested in me checking that out, maybe I'll do that one for Patreon because I already have the France Country Series done. Or maybe I'll do it later. Who knows? Let me know what you think. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew he was defeated. He went to the British and said, can I please have a house near London? And the British replied, really? no. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote Saint places Helena. they could think of, a tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean, St. Helena. Here, a deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Mm -hmm. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as General, rather than calling him Emperor. His mail was censored, his visitors were vetted. There was almost no way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 British soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. For one man, they have 2,000 British soldiers and two ships constantly circling the island. So you can only imagine how much money, I mean, at this point it's in, uh, I don't even know, in the, again, in modern day currency, in hundreds of millions of dollars, the billions, arguably, that, that Britain has spent on the Napoleonic Wars, and now they're spending more money just to guard him, just to make sure this troublesome, ambitious man doesn't escape again. Fascinating. He had once been the most powerful man alive, and images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled yep. old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost <laughs> everything. And okay. by the way, he was only 46. So maybe it's about time you, um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon oh, fought one thanks. last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. And in this battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. And I, I won't speak on this too much because I'll probably do a video on it, but this is one of the most important Congresses in European history. This changes the next, you know, if you really want to argue, it's still affecting us to this day in 2022. Um, yeah, so I won't speak on that too much, but just, a, just an incredibly important Congress. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution, and then another one. Reaction yep. to Napoleon's rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and yep. nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. Mm -hmm. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history. Right, and interesting too here, look who's number three, the Duke of Wellington, who uh, defeated him at Waterloo. So there you go. And his revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. Yep. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. There's still hope for Joe Biden. But the man <laughs> remains somewhat of an enigma. Yeah, I don't and think we so. still aren't sure exactly. I, I don't think for any, you know, <laughs> I'd love to see the day where a U.S. president is on the front lines of a battle again. Yeah what to make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, spreading equality wherever he went, or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch and restricting certain liberties? Was he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hellbent on bringing Europe to its knees? Or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing his power? Some things will continue to be debated. Napoleon Definitely. died at the age of 51, 
officially of stomach cancer, but some believe he may have been poisoned. Yep. The British buried him in a tin coffin inside a mahogany coffin. So why they think he was uh, why they think he was poisoned is because, if I remember correctly, um, I'm going to get the exact chemical terms wrong, but his wallpaper, what it was, um, what would you say? I'm stumbling over my words here. Apologies. Basically, what's the, the substance that was on his wallpaper, I think it was arsenic, I think it might have been arsenic, was, was poisoning him. And so the British did this intentionally to poison and kill Napoleon. That's the theory, at least. Inside a lead coffin, inside another mahogany coffin. I guess this time, they wanted to make sure he stayed where they put him. In 1840, his remains were moved to Paris, where they now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined oh, yeah. to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said, but the memory that is left in the minds of men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. True. Oh, yep. and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Yep, what else is there to say? In my opinion, I think Napoleon was overall a force for good. Again, this is a huge debate, and I'm not as informed as obviously people that are scholars of this time. You know, I just I just read for fun. I just do these for fun. And I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for joining me through this video. Wow, 46 minutes. Okay, super long one. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. We'll be continuing the France Country series as well. Just a few more videos to go. Um, the next big one is going to be, well, not the next video, but the next big video is going to be World War One by Epic History TV. If you haven't already yet, um, go check out the France Country series. If you're interested in more Napoleon videos, join the Patreon. Let me know, hey, you should, you should watch this, you should react to this, and I will put it there on the Patreon for you guys. Thank you again. Hope you've enjoyed. Take care, and I'll see you guys in the next video.